My name is Anna Greer and I'm based at Bristol Law School, UWE in Bristol. Um, I'm head of the International Law and Human Rights Research Unit there, director of the Global Network for the Study of Human Rights and the Environment. Um, and I currently teach civil liberties, theoretical and institutional foundations of human rights and critical and legal reasoning. My pathway to academia was long and complicated. Um, essentially, it began years ago when my divorce lawyers said, you have a fine legal mind, you should be doing law. And I went to do study law again. And while I was studying law again, I fell in love with legal theory. So I decided to go to the University of Oxford and do the two-year BCL, which was quite hardcore. I did jurisprudence and political theory, uh, philosophical foundations of the common law. Um, and some other subjects, um, loved it, absolutely loved it, and decided to go into academia, so became an academic. Within a fairly short time of finishing the BCL, I did some work for a group called Common Purpose, first setting up um, democracy groups for 14-year-olds, and then found a job in Oxford, Oxford Brookes University, and the rest, they say, is history. I don't know that there are direct linkages that you can draw in any kind of causally distinct sort of way, but I think the richness of my life experience inevitably informs my work because I don't close down any categories particularly. Um, and also I think some fairly cons consistent values have always sort of um, been the sort of drumbeat behind my life story in the sense that I've always cared passionately about justice and you know, that's why I decided to do law in the first place when I was 17. I had some naive idea that if I studied law, I'd be able to do something about justice. And that passion has always been there and is, is still there, as is the passion for um, addressing the gap between the powerful and the disempowered. So those themes have informed pretty much everything I've done, but the causal links are extremely tenuous. <laughs> Um, one of the most provocative statements I've ever heard is that the human being is more fictitious to the law than the corporate form. And I think that's such an interesting statement. And actually, I think it's, it's probably right. I mean, we construct notions of humanity all the time in whatever field we're in. But the law does it in a particular way for particular purposes. Um, and so I've always been very provoked about you know, who is the human being in law? How does law construct and populate its universe? Not just with human beings, but with other entities. I mean, the, 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 the notion of the person is um, a complicated notion because it doesn't just refer, of course, to the human being. It refers to the corporate legal person. Um, and there are many theorists who lament the confusion between personhood and humanity. And I would have to say that I agree with that, that discomfort because I don't think... Um, conflating notions of humanity and personhood in, in law are particularly clarifying or helpful in any way. So um, quite a lot of my work, certainly in human rights theory, has been trying to look at the ways that we can actually separate the notion of the human being from the legal construction of the human, because the legal construction of the human tends to prioritise certain features that are taken to be characteristic of human beings, like uh, archetypally their rationality. Um, and of course, you know, um, in Western philosophy and social theory more generally, that has meant, in, in, in major terms, it's meant s submerging those persons or subjects considered to be less than fully rational. So women, children, um, people um, who are mentally incompetent in some way or deemed to be so, etc. So every, every way in which the law constructs the human imports these hidden structures of relative power and disempowerment, relative exclusion and inclusion. And those are the puzzles that I'm particularly interested in, particularly in an age um, at the moment which I feel is characterised by deepening forms of inequality and a widening gap, particularly in socio-economic terms. And I'm interested in the interplay between all those ideas. So that's why I'm so drawn to the notion of the relationship between human and, and the law. Not least because the law is such a central form of social organisation. It has such power, such discursive power. So it's a central field for that kind of inquiry. Yeah, well, they inform it very richly because um, one of the things that I've really noticed in the context of my research work is the role of disembodiment, or what I call quasi-disembodiment, in the construction of the human being in law. 
Um, the body is constructed by law in all sorts of complex ways, but it's also selectively emptied out, particularly within liberal th legal theory, where um, there's a concept of a very bounded person who looks very, you know, bounded in a similar way to the private property contract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and feminism has long criticised the quintessential disembodiment at play in Western liberal theory and philosophy generally. Now, it seems to me that vulnerability, particularly when you emphasize the notion of embodied vulnerability, directly addresses or plays into that closure in quite a critically interesting way. Um, so vulnerability is also a very rich way of opening up to context, and this is another area where feminism as well is particularly strong, because it looks at socio-economic and material contextualization. It looks at the wider political implications of the constructs that are taken to decontextualize or depoliticize, which you know, is a central function, I would say, of a lot of constructs within liberal legal theory, is, is an emptying out of context, an emptying out of embodiment. So vulnerability and feminist theory and other theories that look at embodied difference are very rich and muscular strands of critique that, that are extremely useful when you're looking at trying to replace the liberal autonomous disembodied subject. And, and that's why I particularly like Martha Feynman's um, coinage of the notion the vulnerable subject because it, it captures something of that implicit critique and those implicit possibilities in, in a very neat kind of figuration. Um, so yes, vulnerability is hugely important for the work I'm doing. The other thing I should say is that I don't conceptualise vulnerability as the sole condition of the human being. Um, I think it plays alongside other values, um, but also I think you have to look at the, the vulnerability of the living environment. One of my research areas is increasingly involved with the relationship between human rights and the environment. And I'm convinced that we need a philosophical and theoretical reconfiguration of the way that we even understand the human being in relation to the environment. We need to reconfigure what it means to be human in the vulnerable living order. And so vulnerability, I think, has huge um, explanatory, potentially philosophical and ethical implications for the way that we relate to the world, mm -hmm. which is certainly a core question that lies at the heart of the negative closures, I would say, of liberal, uh, neoliberal, um, so I can say that bit again, <laughs> please, <laughs> core closures of neoliberal economic globalisation, because it seems to me that at the heart of that is a very objectifying um, relationship with nature, whereby nature is just conceived of as a set of resources mm -hmm. that we plunder and use. Um, so I'm very edgy about a lot of languages that emerge like ecosystem services, um, natural resources, law, those kind of things. I can see why people need to speak in those terms, but I'm always alert to the idea that unless you funda fundamentally reconstitute your understanding of what the living order is, there's a danger that what you do is you simply replicate the same closures and predations, but in more subtle forms. I mean, if you put it through a vulnerability lens, clearly the environment itself um, produces forms of vulnerability. I mean, for a start, in ontic terms, we're not all equally in safe environments, even in geo geophysical terms. I mean, some people live in parts of the world where life is reduced by geophysical structures to a much, much more contingent struggle for survival than it is in some other conditions where you've got the ability to create much more harmonious environments around you. But of course, the socioeconomic plays into that because, you know, with enough investment and enough technological assistance in some environments, you can kind of remove your embodied vulnerability one step from the harshness of the geophysical environment that you happen to find yourself in. Um, so, yes, I mean, I suppose the environment and the way that we construct it does mediate and translate into particular forms of vulnerability that are not equally shared. I mean, the most obvious example is the construction of um, climate injustice. I mean, it's, it's been noted time and time again that the um, anthropogenic climate change that drives changes in places like Alaska that threaten entire communities and their entire way of life, threaten people who've contributed very little mm 
to global warming. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense in which we act on the environment and reproduce the environment as a source of vulnerability and as a reflection of the wider disparities that we see within socio-economic structures of neoliberal globalisation. I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer in the sense that theory is always embedded in practice. I mean, the idea that you can somehow be pragmatic and that that's a non-theoretical position is just delusional. Um, theory is always implicit in our choices of practical approach. Um, and therefore, the role of a legal theorist, in a sense, is to render the implicit theories and the implicit closures operative within legal practice visible so that we can at least have critical conversations about them and imagine alternative ways of looking at the relationship between law and practical outcomes. So for me, the work of a legal theorist is, is, fun, is a fundamental work of justice, actually. It's a key contribution to what you could think of as law's systemic self-consciousness. Um, and without legal theorists, um, we wouldn't be any less theoretical or, or be more accurately, we wouldn't be immune from taking up theoretical positions. We'd just be doing it in an unconsidered, unreflective, unconscious way. Um, and so I think the work of legal theory is absolutely fundamental. And I think in that, in that vein, it should be really important for students, moreover, to look at the big theoretical questions that underpin the law. I mean, sending out students to be lawyers without ever having invited them to reflectively consider the nature of the discursive domain in which they're going to become operators seems irresponsible to me. Um, and so legal theory, I think, is absolutely central to the future challenges and the present challenges we face in relation to justice, the way that we structure our social relationship, the way that we structure our relationship with the world. Legal theory is quintessentially relevant to all of that. Well, it just seems to me that if you take critical legal theory as, as an example, um, and I don't, I'm not reading that in a reductive sense, as in just the critical legal studies school of theory, but all those accounts of law, legal relationships, and the contemporary world situation that take a critical position and don't assume normative closures, don't um, assume neutral concepts, etc., etc. If you take that as a broad position, that position has enormous explanatory power, I would say, in relation to the production of the current situation. I mean, if you just take the um, critical accounts of the way that the paradigm liberal legal subject closes out certain groups or tendencies or characteristics of humanity and animality and the environment, if you just take the contours that emerge from critical accounts of legal subjectivity, they map seamlessly onto social um, and sociological accounts of the oppression, the predation, the destruction produced by an over-reliance on uninhibited corporate capitalist exploitation of people, animals and the environment. So, yeah, legal theory has a huge amount to say to the current situation. Well, where I am now, what I'm looking at while I'm here, I'm working on two main pieces of writing while I'm here. One is a chapter in a book that Martha and I are co-editing on vulnerability. Um, and that chapter looks at um, vulnerability set against the background of globalisation um, and looks at the advantage of putting vulnerability theory within the globalised context and in particular borrowing the notion of the unevenness or the tilted nature of the global field and the, the way in which power and oppression c can be usefully conceptualised, um, perhaps not directly causally always, but usefully conceptualised as being co-symptomatic because it's a way of turning your attention to the interrelationality implicit in vulnerability theory, but extending it to forms of global interrelationality, which have huge implications for the way that we conceptualise justice in the global context. Um, so that's one um, thing I'm working on. And the other is a much more technical paper on, on legal subjectivity. Um, I'm, one of my hopes, and this kind of comes into answering where I'm going next, is I'm trying all the time to think about a general theory of legal subjectivity that can respond to 
new claims for new forms of legal subject like animals, elements of the environment, post-human entities, respond to those debates um, while drawing attention to the fundamental failures implicit in legal subjectivity. So what I want to do is I want to try and produce a theoretical account that draws conscious attention it almost and as an imminent matter to its own limitations in relation to the complexities and the concrete mess and the richness of the living real, for want of a better term. So um, I'm trying to look at that and, and I'm trying to think about the gap between law and life in, in the light of a theory of legal subjectivity and then how we think about how we justify the ex expansion of legal subjectivity to particular entities, which of course brings in questions like their interests, the role of vulnerability, the role, if any, of rationality, etc., etc. So it's a really big project, and I suspect that it'll take me on lots of mini projects along the way. But my ultimate aim is to try and really think about the production of a new general theory of legal subjectivity. So that's, the, that's where I'm going. The great thing that looking at um, theory does if you're an undergraduate lawyer or above, I mean above you should be looking at it anyway, but as an undergraduate, I mean certainly in Britain, undergraduates are very driven by the need to pass their exams in the vocational law subjects. But the advantage of looking at theoretical debate is it opens the law up in a completely different way and makes it comprehensible in a completely different way. I'll never forget the revelatory experience of looking at the debates in English constitutional and administrative law about um, the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty and whether or not British law was moving towards a different form of rights-based constitutionalism. Just understanding that theoretical tension meant that I could see why within certain legal cases there were apparently contradictory values and positions in play that had I not understood that underlying tension would have been much more difficult for me to understand as a law undergraduate. So I actually think that legal theory can set your understanding of law alive. It can literally imbue you with a passion about the subject that you will never get from textbooks um, and that you may or may not get from reading cases depending how orientated you are towards finding legal argumentation exciting. But to understand the relevance of law, to understand it in its social context, to understand its deeper relationship with other disciplines, is the most liberating, exciting experience you can imagine as a student. And I literally see students, the lights going on in class sometimes when I'm talking to students about this. And they'll, the students who actually take me up on my advice and go away and read theoretical or academic debates come back and say, wow, I had no idea that law could be so thrilling. So I, that would be my advice. Don't stick to the textbooks. Move beyond the text, far beyond the text, and look into legal theory, not just doctrinal discussion, but look at the underlying values, the big picture, get the patterned um, ideas. Become contentious, become critical, interrogate your subject, um, and understand it as a human being. Understand it as a quintessentially human, anthropological discourse. Open it out. Get rich with it. That's what I would say. Um, I wouldn't say I'm competent in, in either of them anymore, but yes, I trained as a mime in London with, um, well, I trained with David Glass and also Desmond Jones, and for a number of years I practiced six hours a day and did solo performances in various settings and absolutely loved it and thought that that would be what I would do with my life, but um, that, that wasn't how it turned out. Um, and martial arts, yes, I mean, I've, this, this ties into my research in the sense that I've always been passionate about being embodied. I love being in a body. I know that sounds strange, but I love breathing. I love eating and drinking. I love embodied life um, and, and have a fascination for physical movement. So um, the martial arts tied in with that. But that it also ties in with another passion of mine, which is um, I've been a long time meditator and I'm very interested in understanding the deepest struggle to understand the meaning of existence, the, the place of humanity in a, in a wider cosmic sense. So it, it all feeds into that as well.